Hello, friends, and welcome to another installment of Golondrina's live sessions. My name is Laura Gonzalez, Education and Volunteer Manager here at El Rancho de las Golondrinas Living History Museum, located just south of Santa Fe, New Mexico, in the beautiful and historic La Cienega Valley. Joining us today is friend of Las Golondrinas, lifelong seed steward, and creator of Save New Mexico Seeds Coalition, Isaura Andaluz, to share her knowledge and passion about native foods and seeds, mainly Chile Nativo, Quelites, and Verdolagas. An advocate of seed protection and education, she co-founded Arid Crop Seed Cash, New Mexico's largest collection of native drought tolerant seeds, and the Albuquerque Slow Food Group which works to educate consumers about at-risk crops. She has served as board director for New Mexico Farmers Marketing Association, Farmers um, Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association, and the American Origin Products Association. She has also published many works on the subject. She continues her work on climate-adapted crops through the nonprofit Gaia Poesis. If at any time during this segment you have any questions, feel free to put them into the comments and we'll get them answered for you. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Isaura Andaluz. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here today because this is the first week that a lot of the farmers have their chili ready. And so we're gonna go do a little demo, just like what do you do with green chilies? Which is, if, which is when all New Mexicans get so excited about, <laughs> about, about their green chili. So uh, green chilies are an annual crop here in New Mexico. In other countries, they're perennial. They're living and become like trees because the, the, the weather allows them to be that way. So, that's, so in New Mexico, because it is the fall, or the beginning of the fall, early fall this year, uh, everyone w wants to get the green chili first. And then later on, as the season comes along, they want to get the red chili. So how do you know if, it's, if a chili is good? So the first thing is, is like, because chili is green, it's immature. When it's mature, it turns red. So what happens is that if you get the chili when it's too soft, like this is kind of firm, you can feel the firmness of it. As you can see it's better, it's kind of firm, squishy a little bit. Then that means it's ready, to, it's ready to be picked and ready to be roasted. And it needs to be roasted like within one to two days after it's been harvested. Otherwise, what will happen is that you won't be able to peel it. So we have a demo here right now where we have some chili that's being roasted. You can see that it's, 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 it's inflated and eventually it'll, 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 it'll make it sound like a, like a, like a burp. And so they, here they, they call that res, rescolgado. Chile is called other when it burps. <laughs> so this, so you, you just use, keep turning, turning it around until it gets, it gets blistered most, most of the, most of the chili, chili area. And so you can see that it's really speeded up, and you can see that it's um, puffing up right there. And I, and I would just probably normally leave it, leave it just a little bit longer. But then what you do is you take it, and I would put it like in a pot. You let it steam. Not plastic. A lot of people put it in plastic bags, but. It's better to put it like in a, in a pot or, or a bowl that has a lid on it so you can, you can uh, handle it. So what happens is after like, you know, 15 minutes or so, it's, it's, it's ready for you to peel. And you just have, you have to grab the chili and you can tell it's, this is the first chili because it's just coming all off, like, you know, in, in, in one piece. There's nothing that's being stuck here. So if you ever buy a bag of chili and you start to peel it and, it gets, and it's stuck, just forget it. It's, it's, it's not, it's, you're not going to be able to, 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 to peel the chili off. And at that point, you can just um, go buy another bag of chili. So we take off the top, and then you will, you will squeeze out the seeds. You don't want to squeeze it too much because you don't want all the juice to come out. And you can see that the, here the, the, the seeds are nice and, they're nice and white. Let's see this here. They're nice, they're, nice, they're nice and white here, the seeds. And what I want to point out is that a lot of people always think that the seeds are what's spicy. But what's spicy is the along these glands right here is, 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 is where the capsaicin is, and this is, this is what makes it spicy. So if you're ever doing chilies and they're too hot, what you'll do is you'll open it up, and you, you'll have these veins here, and that's what you'll, you'll actually literally like pull them off if it's too hot of a chili and you, and you can't eat it. But for our purposes, we'll just take the seeds off, and then we'll just chop it up, and you end up with 
the chili with garlic and salt. This is like traditional New Mexico ch green chili, just garlic and salt, and that's it. So we can put use this green chili for many things, but right now I want to, want to kind of come back to other crops that are also here in New Mexico that 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 are native to New Mexico that can be added with to, to the to the chili. And I try to make everything very simple to show you that that a lot of these a lot of these uh, uh, like the 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 a lot of these vegetables here. And, and the spices like you know like garlic and shallots it can be combined in many, many different ways with our with our with our greens so on here we also have before I forget is that we have our our, our first chili that we roasted and now it's been on, on, a, on a flour tortilla and has this has like you know nice tomatoes underneath it and they have the sour cream on top and this is usually like the first thing that everyone eats in the beginning of the season is a little a little, little taco of the roasted chili with the tomatoes and, and sour cream. So, what I brought here is a, 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 something that we, that's called purslane, verde larga. Some people call it verde larga, other people call it verde, verde, verde larga. But what it is, is that this is one plant. This is only one plant here, and it's huge. And you, you'll see them in different areas, especially when you have like bare ground. You'll see the ground is just co covered with this verde larga. And people always like you know wonder like oh this is a weed you know we you know there's all these weeds that are coming up here on the on this on, in the ground, but the thing is that it's serving a, a, a purpose. What it is, it's covering the soil to protect the soil so that other things can start can start can start growing. So now like we've had this we just had this horrible wind right wind this past year here in New Mexico, so uh, it helps prevent soil erosion. So it's actually good to have this in in your in your in your area, and the, and and the the larga guy is actually. There's many, many different varieties, and this one is, is probably the one that's most common here in New Mexico, and it's kind of rough. And what you would do is you would, you would, you would take, take don't, I don't use the stems on this one because they're so thick, but, but, to harp to, but to use it, I just pull off the, the, each, each little branch. And you just take each little branch off of this off, and then what you'll do is you'll rinse them, and then you'll chop them up. And this, and then you'll have your verde largas. I wanted to show you another type of verde larga, which is this one that grows upright and it's very, very tall. So see the comparison between <laughs> the one that grows flat on the ground, this one, and this one is better to be eaten raw. And and you can see that the leaves are the leaves are, are succulent, but they're also very tender. You can add this is very good to make a salad with, and this one is not native, but the people are start growing, starting to grow it more here, like in flower pots. It's really great because it has a lot of little seeds, and um, it has a beautiful little yellow flower. And then this, all of these are little seed little seed pockets, and so you'll have like you know so many seeds that they'll just go everywhere. But it's a, it's really great to have because in a flower pot, it'll be one of the first things that comes up in the springtime. Isaura, we had a question come through for you. Um, someone out there is wondering if there are any vitamins or what vitamins might be found in a verdolaga. Very high in vitamin C. It's one of the best things that you can have is, is for vitamin C. Also, chili is it'll also have very high in vitamin C. So it's good that it's chili season because we got to get our vitamin C to not get sick right now, right? <laughs> Thank you, Isaura. Yes. So you can just take this and you can chop it up and you can add like uh, some garlic to it. You can add purple onion, some feta cheese, and then just some olive oil and lemon juice. And you have a perfect salad with, with, these, with this type of tip of verde larga. The other one that's native, and it's still, you know, all the little seeds are here on the ground, on, I mean on the table, is another, this one is native here to New Mexico, but it's also very small. And as you can see, the comparison of the leaf, like this one is, is thicker, and this is thinner, and it's also a bit sh shorter. So this one too, it, it doesn't spread as much as, 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 as that, other, that one does. And also that the branches are not as coarse. So this one you can actually just chop it all up and just cook it this way. You don't have to, you don't have to de 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 stem it. The other greens that we have are quelites. And quelite basically is a word for greens. But, but here in New Mexico, it's, it's, it's all, these, all these wild spinaches. 
But the first one I'm going to show you is something I learned this morning, uh, the name of the, what, what it's called here. So this is called Palmer, Palmer Amaranth. And this one can be a lot, of pro, a, a lot of problems because it's wind pollinated. So if this can get huge, like really, really tall with a lot of water, and the trunks can become very, very tough and really hard to pull out. So a lot, a lot of farmers hate this, this, this Palmer Amaranth. But here they, all, they call it quelite de, de, de marrano or quelite de, de burro because of the tail. It has to be like the tail of the pig or the tail of the, of the burro. And this one is only really edible when it's really tiny. Because as, as, as you can see here, all, the, all those, the seed heads are already starting to develop. And also the leaves become very bitter. But this is, this is something that was commonly eaten here a long time ago. Also very high vitamin C. And this palm of amaranth and, and, the, the, and, and here, the calitas I'm going to show you, they're all the same family. And they're also related to like quinoa. They're all called quinoa pods. So two of the, uh, two of the calitas that I have here, um, this is what is called like the white quelite because if, I don't know if you can see it very well, but it has like a white, sh white little white fuzz on the back of it. And it also has many, many seeds. Let me see if I can get the one here and start to develop here. These are just starting, starting to, to, to form seeds, to form little, little seeds if you look at the top. These are also very nutritious, vitamin A, vitamin C, and the, the little seeds have a lot of omegas in them. And people sometimes, in some countries, and even here, they, people used to take the seeds and they would like bake them into like different, you know, like people here use them now for muffins and things like that, but the people used to bake with them and, and make little, little patties. So this galite is like a wild spinach. And, and, and um, it's basically, it's also actually illegal in Albuquerque to grow this if it's taller than four, than four inches tall because it, it can become invasive because of all the seeds. But it's also, also the same thing that it does as a, like the first thing where it covers all the, all the soil. So for example, there's parts of my yard that I will leave to let it be covered with galites. And what happens is as, as the season comes along, I go around the yard and I will, I will pull the ones that are tall. So I, I, leave the, I leave the smaller ones, but the taller ones I pull them, and the other ones start growing, and you have a constant supply of wild spinach in your yard. And this one has now naturalized in my yard, because this one normally used to go to seed like, you know, March, April, but now I mean, it grows in my yard all year round. And this one is very easy to harvest, so you do, we just strip all the leaves down, and then you, you cook it like, like spinach. The other one that's kind of been an import, And some people call this magenta spring. This that was a marketing name for it. I think it really originally came from India. But it has a beautiful little little magenta center. Except it, when when you cook it, it doesn't it does not pink anymore. It goes away. And the same thing. It's also you know very nutritious. And you can see the leaves are, are larger. Well, actually they look the same right now. At this at this stage they look the same. But this can also become like the palm like the palmer amaranth that I was talking about. It gets very tall. And sometimes this is called tree spinach because you need to be like like five feet tall or so. And again, this one also has the same problem with the seeds; they just go everywhere. But like I said, if you could, if you have a little air in your yard in your yard, and it had, you just have bare spare soil, this is something that, that you would want to see in your soil. So what we did was, um, was I was trying to show like how you could use these crops and cook them with things that we have that we have, that we normally have here around this this time. So right now, I mean, garlic does really, really well here in New Mexico. I mean, it's one of the best things that we have because it doesn't require a lot of water. And also onions, this is like these are little shallots, you know, onions. The southern part of New Mexico, like in Las Cruces there, they, 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 do, they do a lot of onions down there. And then, of course, tomatoes are now coming in, in season. It's been kind of a rough year for tomatoes, but that's one of the things that we've been working with is to try to find a tomato that, you know, becomes adapted to, that does well here, here in this area with the climate change. And then, of course, calabacitas. And I'm going to talk here with the galacitas in a second, but this is like the, the traditional crooknick squash. And the other thing is potatoes, which we also can grow here. And this can also be added to, to our galitas and, um, and, then, and, our, and our squash. So the first, the, the first dish that, that, I, that, we, that, I, that I did is basically use the squash and this is basically like a, like a, like a, like calabacitas that we make here in New Mexico. 
But instead of putting the corn in it, uh, I, I, I would just I would just put you know you you can I mean this is the, the squash just by itself but you can add you, you can add the calitas to it you can add calitas to it of, of any kind and I did try some with purslane but the purslane you don't want it to cook too much so basically it's better if you just use calitas like to make to make the squash dish and the other thing I found instead of using like the regular cheese that people use the white cheese with camp with roquefort like the blue cheese roquefort it was really 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 delicious and this just has onions and garlic. And the same thing, I used the other base, onions and garlic, and we did, this is equilites. And so you can see they're, they're, they're still, these are whole, they kind, of, they kind of crisp up a little bit when you put them in the, one, in the oil. So you would put the garlic and the onions in first, and then you would throw in the quilites, and, and um, you, let, 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 them, let, them, let them wilt down. You can also add a little bit of water and cover them up. And some people sometimes add tomatoes, and, and, and then, then at the end, they'll add beans. So this is like a full meal here because you have the protein from the beans and the, the, all the greens with all the, all the, all the vitamins and, uh, and it tastes really delicious. And all of these can, can have the green chili just put, in, put into it, mixed in with it before you, before you serve it. And the last dish I had here was this is the purslane. And it doesn't look very, very appetizing, but it was very, very delicious. And again, it was the garlic and the onion base. And then, um, what I did was add, it said it just needed some ba like people here sometimes put bacon. They use bacon oil or use put bacon into this. And I just put I didn't have any bacon, but I used uh, some mm -hmm. prosciutto. I just took the prosciutto and put it like in the on the on the comal, let it get all crisped up, and then I just put it into here and there you, there you had it. So all of these, I mean, any any anything here can, can be can be added with the, with the green chili, and so you have all the native native galites, the purslane and the, the chili, and it's a very simple meal you can make. And also to like, like, like this calitas here with the, with the onions and, and garlic, you can add it, add it to an egg and make an omelet with it. And the same thing with the, with the purslane here. Um, so the other thing we have that I want to show you is, so, so, we, so we keep adapting different crops. And so one of the crops that, that we have been, have been trying to keep that someone created a long time ago is this melon. And it's called, it's called Oro de Esperanza. And the melon was, was, is from Anita, let's see, Anita Chavez from Corral, Corrales. And her and her husband, they try to create a, a, a tastier melon. And so they mix the, the New Mexico melon, native melon, with the Crenshaw and with the uh, Rocky Ford. And they came up with this new, basically a new, div, a new melon. And so we've just been caretaking this melon and keep growing it out year after year to try to increase the number of seasons so that I think people can, 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 can also enjoy these melons, keep them going. So what do you do with, after, after the season comes along? So if you, if, you have, if you want to roast the chili, you would put it into a pot like, like we were talking about before, and then you want to freeze it for the rest of the season. So what, what we usually do is put them in little, little, little bags. And some people peel them, and some people leave them, leave them whole. I, I prefer to leave them with the skins on, because I just think that it's easier when I, when I, when I, when I thaw them out afterwards to, to, to clean them. And usually I package them like, like four or five, or maybe you can decide how many you want, because you don't want them to last more like than three days. So for example, these chilies that I've chopped up and add the garlic too, and the salt, after day three, if, it's, if you haven't eaten it, then what you want to do is you want to make it into like a salsa. So you could add tomato sauce or like crushed tomatoes and some, some spices like, you know, so you buy cumin, other people add, add, add Mexican oregano, and you just make a salsa. You can add a little bit of water to it and make it as thick or, 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 as, uh, or as thin as you want. And then this salsa, you can make huevos rancheros. So with that, you would take a, a corn tortilla and you, 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 you fry just a little bit to make it soft. You set it aside. And then you cook your eggs, like, you know, scramble or, which not typical, but it's more typical to have like over easy, over medium. And then you take your salsa that you made with your old, with your, with your old green chili and you have another, another meal. And then that salsa can stay in your fridge for like for about a week or so. But I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have eaten, eaten it before then. So the way that we do the, the freezing is, is that you'll, pack, you'll package your chili. And then, and then I like to do it in a double bag because I don't want my freezer to smell like chili. I mean, I love those way chili smells, but I don't want to get into my other, other foods. So I put it into another freezer bag. This is important to, to, to use the, 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 the real freezer bags. And 
I mark it. So this was the stitcher that I had to, here is at Risco, and I put the date, which is August 20th, 820. So this way you know, like if you know, if your bags get lost in the back of the freezer, like when it was, when it was, when you have to put it there. And I take all the air out of the bag, and then it lays flat. And you can just put it in the freezer and just stack up your chili in, in this way. The other way that I've done, done it is, is that I've taken like, like the, the chili that's been cleaned, and then I cut, then I cut, I cut apart. And I'll take this, and I'll put it on a, on a dehydrator. And, I, and I, lay it, I lay it right side up, and I leave it for like about, about an hour or so, and then I turn it, up, turn it uh, upside down. Because I don't want all the moisture to, to collect in here, and I want to make sure that it dries up. And so this takes about four or five hours in a dehydrator, like at 135, 130, 135 more or less. And then you can just put it in jars afterwards and store it, and that I mean, lasts forever and ever and ever. And this is what's what people used to put in, would, would hang it up outside. They would peel it and hang it outside, and it was called chile pasado. And it, and, and it would turn kind of dark. But it's really, it's really a, a way to preserve it for a, a long, term, long time. And then when, then when you're going to use it, like, like if you're doing a dehydrator, it's very thin. So you can basically can just like crumble it into your soups or, you know, I mean, just good to eat with like, just, just like kind of like, like jerky, like beef jerky. You, I have made like little packets with seeds and just put a little bit of this crushed chili in there. And it's really nice because you have like the smoky flavor, but it's dry and it's a little bit spicy. And if you hang it, the chili is going to have more of a, a, a rustic flavor and it'll it'll be darker and, and that's also that's really good to cook like with like uh, like if you make like a, a, a like a, some really nice pork you can just cook it with that long term you can add chicos to it and um, the, the you can also like cook it with some 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 cheese if you have like like queso fundido that they call it where you just melt the cheese with a with with the, with the chili after you soften it for for like over, overnight and I don't know if there's any other questions you have. Any questions coming through there from our Facebook friends? Oh, and I wanted to talk about. Oh yes, go ahead. Okay. So the other thing is, I wanted to just talk to everyone about is, is about the about wine in New Mexico because we have grapes that they were brought down from, brought down from the Camino Real from Mexico City to Okeowinge is, is, the, is the, the gold Camino Real, and that's where the chilies came up, 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 up through from the Spaniards and some, other, and some other people that did exchanges. And we also had grapes. And one of the things that, that, we, that I have been working for in the last 20 years is like with, you know, trying to help build the infrastructure of agricultural, of all the agricultural uh, products or systems here in, in New Mexico. And we worked with a lot of different farmers and seed growers. But one of the, one of the things that we're facing right now is we're facing that uh, crisis in our, in our in our wine industry because of, of, of the lack of sales and so what everything like you know everything is a process and everything has to continue and so for example like if the, you know if, if we don't have the pickers for the chili then the chili is going to rot in the fields and so the same thing is happening is with the grapes is that now there's an excess amount of grapes because they haven't been able to to, to bottle new the wine so their tanks are full of, of wine and all the grapes can't be processed and so they're, they're, the New Mexico wine, it's called NewMexicoWine.com um, they're, they're, they have specials on all the New Mexico wines and they're also going to do something they call Grape Aid so, that, so in case that we can't get all the, they can't get all the grapes sold you know, to, that they can uh, produce a wine that they can be sold for, you know, to, help, to help bring money for, for all, the, all of the wine industry Wonderful. Thank you for that, Isara. And um, we have more information on um, the Great Aid on our social media pages, on our Facebook and our Instagram. Um, so be sure to check that out. So I hope you all learned something today. I know I sure did. And I definitely got hungry, which is good because it's just about dinner time. So Isara, I'm wondering, so our official New Mexico state question is red or green. Do you have a preference? Red. Red. Red because because I'll let me, let me I'll tell you about why. Um, so a lot of a lot of the chili here that you know, the, the the hatch chili one thing we talks about there is no such thing as hatch chili. There's chilies that that, that are grown down in the hatch area, 
But as far as variety, it's not, it's, 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 not, it's, it's no, there's no variety named, named Hatch. You can call it Hatch. So um, those chilies, there, there was, there were, varieties were created by NMSU in spaces like, like for the big roasting and canning and, and, and processing. But the chili, like basically like from Socorro on up, a lot of people still have what's called chili nativo, which is a native chili. So the difference you can tell is like, for example, this chili is really smooth. And when you have the, when you have the more, more modern varieties, they're a bit more wrinkly because they have more water in them. But these are smaller chilies and they're thinner. And so they have more, more flavor. So the green is like if you have the one, the, the, the thick skin for the for roasting, that's great for the green. But for red, this is one that has has the most flavor. I mean, it has more flavor because it's concentrated. So that's this is my preference. And um, again, you know, you would take these, and they actually taste better if they age for a while. You know, you want them. You don't want to use them like like if you harvest them now, like in you know September, October. You want to give them several months for the flavor to kind of just like I don't know, just get stronger, more more more, more sweet. I think. Excellent. Green or red? I'd have to agree. Um, I think generally my preference is red as well, but I don't know, man. I love those green chili chicken enchiladas. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the beginning of the season, I mean, this is like, I mean, my favorite thing is that the flour tortilla with the sour cream, you know, and, and the chili, you know, and then like if it was foods like this, or on a hamburger, I mean, and then, but then like, especially like in the wintertime, I want my red with the chili chicken enchiladas. Now, winter is great for the Great. And on everything, you know, for if you're a native New Mexican, I think we, we put chili on everything. <laughs> There's no wrong way to enjoy chili. Uh, we did have another question come through from our Facebook viewers. They're wondering how long it takes to grow chili. Oh, that's a good question because this year has been probably the most difficult year we've had. I mean, I've been growing for like over 30 years, and it's like this is the most difficult year everyone's been facing. Um, well, I mean, normally it depends. It depends on your, where you live and how. And which, like for example, in northern New Mexico, the plants are smaller. Down south, the plants are going to be bigger. And so it's anywhere like like about 60 to 90 days. I mean, right now I have some that've been growing for more than 90 days, and they're just still barely just starting to put on, put on uh, the flowers. And so, so I, you know, it's kind of things are changing. And like right now, everything like this whole season is like, has been speeded up. So we don't have much of a spring anymore, and we don't have much of a fall anymore. And it's like everything's shortening up. Yeah. And right now, like plants that should be blooming like in mid-September are blooming now. And so, so a lot of the chili, the people that I've talked to, the plants aren't ready yet. You know, the, the peppers aren't growing yet. And this is why the, the work that you do is so important, just educating people about the seeds and native seeds and about the effects of climate change on our local crops. You know, that's yes. something really important to know. So for example, like this is a Chilean that that's very, very old. And, it, and it's, it's a lot smaller. You can see, you can see that this is like, and still this is a native one from here too, but this is even older than this, than this variety here. And what happens is like these, 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 these seeds save every year and the, and the chili seeds are planted from year to year. So each year, the seeds keep, 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 keep uh, you know, acclimated to, the, to, to what's happening in the, in the temperature. If it rains more, if it gets colder. And sometimes you have to bring in another chili from another area. For example, like, you know, if I'm down in Albuquerque, my chili might be, might be this size, but someone here up in Velarde might, you know, or somewhere even further up a little bit, they'll be smaller. But maybe I want it to be a shorter season because like, for the north, it's, the season seems is shorter. It's, it doesn't take that long to have the chili. It just depends on you know, what variety you have. So the, the chilies, you know, I would maybe want to mix those seeds together to increase the genetic diversity, but also that, that then that this chili that I plant the following year is going to be able to, to, to withstand the heat in Albuquerque and also the cold like, from up, up, like Velarde or something like that. And also, it makes them stronger to, to diseases. So, for example, most of the, most of the problem they have is with this chili wilt. I mean, the native chili don't have don't have that issue, and and, and, and so I mean, it may make them more valuable. But that's another thing is like, well, the seeds need to be protected too, that they don't get contaminated with other things that you know that, that, will, that maybe will weaken uh, the, the peppers. Yeah. Gosh, so interesting. Um, some of our viewers are also wondering if they want to get their own garden started and want to access some of these native chili seeds, where's the best place for them to start that? You know, if, if they can just uh, contact me, you know, okay. 
You can actually go, if you could just, for right now, we are, I mean, I'm with Guy Poises, but we've been working with, basically I've been working with Cuatro Puertas. So what happened was we created Cuatro Puertas about 20 years ago, and it was to help, you know, build the infrastructure of agriculture and also do economic de development in general. And we started the Aircraft Seed Cash at that time. And so we've been going along with the seeds and, and focused on agriculture, but as far as economic development, I think now we really just need to focus more on agriculture itself. And so we created Gaia Poesis to kind of do this, this type of work. So, but for now, they can go to info at C, the number four, puertas, P U E R T A S dot org, and, and contact us, and, and, and we'll get in touch with them, and you know, we'll go from there. And we, in the past, we also had done a lot of classes to teach people how to have it, because like now's a good time to be thinking about next year. Because like, can you know, can you start putting something in, you know, like uh, compost in your soil or, or sheet mulching or you, you know, or figure out where you want to plant next year or do a raised bed, you know, and then also they can start planting something now that's small. Absolutely. And to our viewers, if you're interested in learning more about Isara Andaluz and the work that she does, um, about her programs. As I mentioned, she has authored several published works on various subjects dealing with seeds and climate change and agriculture. Um, go ahead and get in touch with us through our Facebook. You can put um, questions or comments right into the into the uh, comment section there on the post. Um, you can contact us at golondrinas.org and we'll be sure to get you in touch with Isaura. As I said, it's been a real pleasure to have Isaura here today. She's a dear friend of Las Golondrinas. Um, normally when we're able to open, of course, we remain closed for the time being. She is a participant at our food festival. Um, so we wanted to have her out anyway to talk to you a little bit about food and to celebrate uh, a little bit about that New Mexican cuisine. So again, Isaura, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and, and sharing your knowledge with all of us. Um, so get in touch with us if you um, need more information about any of that. Um, please check back on our Facebook, on our Instagram at SF Golondrinas um, to learn details about our next installment of Golondrinas live sessions for other resources or to learn more about Golondrinas. Uh, remember that your adventure starts at golondrinas.org. Um, I wish you all a very happy and safe weekend. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope that you're all safe and well. And um, our thoughts and prayers go out to all of you that are, uh, have been affected by the recent fires and uh, to the first responders that are working so hard to keep us all safe. Um, we really hope that those fires get contained soon and that everybody is safe and healthy and well. And I hope to see you guys again in two weeks. And if you're all interested in getting some fashionable face gear with our Golondrinas logo, um, go ahead and visit us at our website, golondrinas.org. Get in touch with us either via email or telephone number to get yours ordered. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.